now with the 58 hour water outages that we're facing because of ran water maintenance people are scrambling to get their hands on water storage tanks and their uh, water tankers that are delivering water to communities as well but let's talk about uh, having a water backup solution and uh, also drilling a borehole drilling a borehole is a co complex and costly process that requires careful planning and preparation so let's share some tips so we spoke about how you can evaluate and minimize your risk by investigating other boreholes in your area right because if you contract a borehole driller or a water well driller if they drill 100 meters down into the ground and if they drill a dry hole you still have to pay for that 100 meters that they drill and roughly it's a thousand rand per meter, right? So if you if if you if they drill a hundred meter dry hole, that's about a hundred thousand rand that's just gone to waste. Next, you need to choose a reputable borehole driller, and you can only choose a reputable borehole driller from word of mouth and getting other people's experience on on these drillers. Because a, a reputable borehole driller will drill a hole that's not going to collapse. Now, during my evaluation of borehole dr drillers, there were some drillers that drilled holes and they collapsed. You don't want to drill a hole, pay a large sum of money, and then it collapses. You need, your borehole driller needs to understand the geology of the area, what stone or what he's actually drilling in. You need to check the equipment and the technique that your driller is using. Now, the driller that I use, look, if I have a look and, at the, the equipment, I'm not going to know whether the, the equipment is fit for purpose or not, right? I'm not sure how you can check this, but what I can tell you is during the process of drilling, my driller was periodically placing a spirit level against the equipment and making sure that that, dr that hole is being drilled true and it's not going skew that's another thing that you need to um, determine and that can can only be determined by the number of years that that driller has been in business for okay after you drill the hole then you're left with a, a deep hole and you're left with some steel casing that's uh, protruding out of the ground. Then you need to work out what do you do with the hole. Are you going to develop the hole or are you going to leave it as is? Some people leave it as is for a number of years and they develop it later on at, a, at some other stage. Some of them just install the pump and install a tap and use it for irrigation. So look, it's up to you what you want to do, but drilling a borehole can be done in stages. You can drill the hole, leave it for a couple of years. When you have more uh, some funds available, you can continue with, uh, with developing that hole. Once a hole is drilled, you need to install a submersible pump into that hole. Once uh, the pump is installed, then you need to plumb the water from that pump and probably put it into a storage tank. Now, some holes are yielding a high quantity of water per hour in excess of a thousand liters per hour you don't need a storage tank right but generally what i've seen here in south africa is that water from the hole is pumped for this is now for domestic purposes it's pumped and stored into a tank from the tank there's a booster pump that will pump the water throughout your house right it, the, the what the water will be reticulated throughout your house and that booster pump is something else that you need to consider after your your tank now that you've got that in order you also need to test that water now some people drink water straight out of the hole but that's not safe to do so unless you test it there are certain parameters according to uh, south african laboratory testing and standards it's called the sans 241 and it, it tests a couple of things like uh, heavy metals uh, e coli coli forms and so on a reputable laboratory can test your water and give you an opinion whether that water is portable or not. When it comes to water purification, this is now a whole science on its own because you can submit your results to a number of water purifiers and every single one of them will give you a different opinion or a different method to treat that water. Treating water is quite expensive. You can spend anywhere from 20,000 Rand 
to 50,000 Rand to treat that water, depending on the mechanism that you've chosen. There's also maintenance issues, uh, maintenance implications. You need to maintain your filtration or purification system periodically. It requires periodic maintenance. And depending on which options you choose, one option may require more maintenance and another option may require less maintenance or automate. Let's take a look at my setup here. So we've got a 5,000 litre storage tank here. And here we've got a disc filter. So this is a raw borehole water coming from the submersible pump and into the hole. This is a disc filter and it is a, I think it's a 100 micron, 120 micron filter. And this tap here will give you raw borehole water. So it's unfiltered, unpurified water. It's water straight out of the hole. It's just been filtered with a 130 micron filter. The 130 micron filter is just to capture uh, small silt and stones and any debris instead of going into the tank and settling in down into the tank because if it settles into the tank, then it becomes a problem to, to get, that, get the tank clean. Let's take a look at the water. So this is raw unfiltered borehole water. And it's pretty clear there are some some very fine contaminants that i can see now some water some water is out of the ground it could appear brownish or orangish depending on what um, minerals are present in the water let's look at the um, purification system under here we've got our booster pump and the booster pump that we had started off with was a dab jet smart booster pump and that one was pushing out about 2.5 bar pressure and it although it was a small pump it was capable of supplying three households so it's quite a powerful pump although it's 2.5 bar it was it was supplying three households so it was impressive the problem with the with that pump is that if these filters here get clogged then your pressure is significantly reduced especially on a double story level and the other thing is that pump was a single speed pump whereas the pump that we have here now is a variable speed pump and the variable speed pump adapts the speed according to the demand if one person in your household is opening a tap it will be able to adapt the speed and the power consumption based on that one tap that's open right so say for example this one is a um, it's a variable speed driven pump and it's capable of pushing out i think 1.5 or 1.1 kilowatt so if you open up a tap just one tap and that requires say 300 watts then it will only consume 300 watts that's the advantage of having a variable speed a pump and we'll show you the pump just now and then these are all the filters now these are so-called big blue filters and based on the quality of my water uh, this big blue system has been installed so what's happening here the first filter is a polypropylene or called a or so-called a pp filter and this is a five micron filter the next one is a ph uh, adjustment filter this one is a carbon block filter and we'll show you examples of the carbon block and the pp filter this is a granular activated carbon with some kdf kdf is a um, it's an alloy with some copper in it and the granular up, uh, activated carbon is um, is carbon that is crushed into fine granules and that absorbs your heavy metals and things like lead and so on that's present in the water and these are alkalinity and calcite boosting uh, media that just increases alkalinity and also uh, increases ph this is uh, silifos and the silifos is just to uh, protect the pipes from hard and corrosive waters okay this is the pump this is a dab easy box pump and this is one of the best pumps that you, you can get in the market it's got a L lcd display here and it uh, indicates um, how many cubic meters of water was delivered or was pumped it um, it also tells you if there's any um, false or warnings and currently it's set at 4.1 bar and it tells you how many times it started and uh, how long it's been running for and how much power it saved so this is an impressive pump and as i said it's one of the best pumps on the market that you can get somebody told me that they've seen a dab easy box that pumped 5 million liters of water okay so 
this is what a polypropylene filter looks like or a pp filter this is a five micron filter and this is one that was used so when it comes brand new we'll show you a brand new one now it's all pure white and this one was it still had some life in it because the inside you you can see it's like concentric uh, circles of polypropylene uh, they call it a melt blown polypropylene filter it's still white inside so this one could have still been used maybe for another maybe 5000 liters so i probably replace this too soon the ph adjustment and this is for corrosive waters so this is a cartridge that goes and fits inside the big blue if you can see here there's some there's there's little sort of white stone then i think it's made of calcite or calcium carbonate it's a stone and this once the water passes through it it raises the ph but it doesn't raise the ph as much because in these big blue filters it probably raises the ph by according to the lab test that i've done before and after it raises the ph by about 0 0.7 so if your ph is say 7 to start with your np ph would be about 7.7 .7. okay so these are the cartridges that go in there let me show you a um, carbon block filter this is a brand new polypropylene filter or pp filter and look at the difference here so this is a 5 micron you get different sizes you get 10 micron you get uh, 20 micron as well so 5 micron just means that you're gonna capture or the filter is gonna capture particles that are almost invisible to the eye and then this is a this is a used carbon block filter it's a little bit brown because it's got this that sediment that is uh, that, that it was filtering out of the water and a carbon block filter is simply a one solid piece of carbon and carbon is used for absorbing any unpleasant taste or odor that's present in the water so we've shown you the ph media we've shown you the pp we've shown you the carbon block there's one more filtration a stage that uh, i haven't mentioned and it's not here and that is a uv light so we've got a uv light that's in the tank and it's it's actually at the top of the tank and it's a submersible uv light so uv lights they they are capable of uh, affecting the dna of bacteria and viruses and it renders them harmless that's the effect of uv light most people ac actually recommend having the uv light as part of your your filtration system here on top of the big blues is the uv light i prefer to use the in tank um, the in tank option because i wanted the water to have maximum exposure to the uv light so if if the water is is sitting in the tank the uv light remains on all the time the water is going to be exposed to the uv light 24 7 that's just my preference right and um, maybe i'm wrong but there are pros and cons to both of these uh, these um, options the issue i found with the submersible uv light is that the quartz glass if the water is particularly hard meaning it's high in calcium and high in magnesium when hard water is exposed to a heat source it starts causing a crust onto that uh, source of heat so if you if you have hard water and you have a look at your kettle element you'll find that your kettle element has captured and built up this uh, crust which is a mixture of calcium and magnesium on it it's either white or it's a uh, bit orangish to reddish that means that a high amount of uh, calcium and magnesium uh, present in the water causes your water to be hard now the problem with having the the submersible uv light is as the light runs all the time it's gonna generate heat and the calcium and the magnesium that's present in the water goes and bonds onto that quartz glass and you it's difficult to remove you got to replace that glass after after a year or maybe two years whereas with the light above the big blue i'm not sure how um, that is um, i haven't had much uh, any experience with that but maybe share your comments and and tell me what you think the, the the submersible uv light is still fit for purpose and after testing the water it was free from any e coli and uh, any coli form so what's important to test as part of your water you got to test whether you got to test the hardness of the water there's something called an lsi index which is a langlier saturation index that indicates whether the water is corrosive or 
scale forming. If it's corrosive, then the water is going to leach calcium uh, from your piping and eventually your pipes are going to going to develop holes and, and start leaking. If it's scale forming, then your pipes are going to be, uh, it's going to be, it's going to, it's going to build up with calcium and magnesium over time and it's going to damage your dishwasher, your what, your washing machine and your other appliances. That's scale forming. So you want your Langlia saturation index to be maybe uh, at minus, minus 0 0.3 or even 0. Uh, a high negative LSI means that minus one, one, minus 1 to minus 2 means that it's highly corrosive and uh, a positive LSI means that it's scale forming. Other things that uh, you should test is turbidity. Turbidity is the, the measure of the clarity of the water. If the water is uh, is uh, is highly turbid, then having a an, a submersible in tank UV light is not going to be effective because if the UV light cannot spread throughout the the, the tank, then it's not going to uh, it's not going to kill the bacteria and viruses. Then you would you'd, you'd want to filter the water first and then uh, pass the water through a UV light. Heavy metals like mercury, arsenic, and other neurotoxins like lead. Lead is something that you do, you do not want to ingest, especially if you have younger children. Adults tend to absorb less lead in their bodies. However, small kids, young kids, they their bodies absorb more lead into their bodies and lead is a neurotoxin that means that it'll affect kids uh, brains and nervous system ability to concentrate you must always make sure that you you do the comprehensive SANS 241 test and lead is part of that test fluoride is another one that you want to watch out for fluoride is good for your teeth however it's over a long term it's it's unhealthy for your body so you don't want to ingest high levels of fluoride uh, into your body and there are a couple of other parameters like nitrates and sulfates e coli and coli forms is something that you don't want to um, ingest as well so the uv light will take care of that let's take a look at what a lab will test for now when you select a lab again do this by by word of mouth get uh, recommendations from people who've used these labs before and also ask the lab before you test what are they accredited for some labs are accredited to test certain parameters whilst others are not and also some more advanced labs are able to test parameters highly accurately and some labs they, they're able to test up to a certain limit or threshold so for example if you are targeting to reduce lead to zero then the labs that i found out there they cannot accurately say whether lead has been reduced to zero or it is less than a certain threshold usually if they do not specify an actual or absolute value it means that they're not accredited to test beyond that. So let's take a look now at what they would test, typically test. A comprehensive SANS 241 test would comprise of pH, electrical conductivity, TDS or total dissolved solids, total alkalinity, chloride, sulfate, nitrate, nitrogen, ammonium, fluoride, calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, aluminium, iron, manganese, chromium, copper, nickel, zinc, cadmium, lead e coli coli forms turbidity total hardness total organic carbon cyanide some of them will also test for cyanide and then we mentioned the langlier saturation index in addition to the sans testing if you purchase these test strips the test strips will provide epa or world health organization recommended ranges or parameters now from what we've mentioned you see mercury wasn't mercury wasn't part of it arsenic is not part of it and uranium is not part of it now if you're living in an area near mines or you're living in a mining town you need to at least test for uranium as well because uranium and arsenic they are present naturally in the ground but um, depending on the nature of the mine uranium may be more prevalent in that area the cost of these sands comprehensive tests are anywhere between 3000 and 4000 rand depending on the lab some labs allow you to test for certain parameters 
some have a minimum uh, amount that they'll charge deter depending on on what you what you want to test what i what i did was i started off with a full comprehensive test and then depending on which parameters i wanted to reduce i made a made some changes and then i tested just for those parameters and let me know your experience in the comments below and thank you for watching